welcome everyone. Thank you to all of you who have uh, come online with us uh, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, my name is Krista McIntyre and I will be your moderator uh, for today. I do want to begin uh, just first with a acknowledgement of the land that we are on. The LifeMark Health Group team acknowledges that our work spans many territories and treaty areas, and we have we are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us and the youth that inspire us. We recognize the land and the benefits it provides all of us and we invite everyone to reflect on the past and present history in their particular geographic area and for us each to think about what we can do to work towards reconciliation. Now, Thank you again to those that are have been able to uh, join us tonight. I just wanna begin with a few administrative uh, housekeeping items. Um, as you may have heard, the session is being recorded. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of that. We will be making the recording available uh, about a week after the session and you will receive uh, an email directly from us, the link to it. So you'll be able to follow up and watch it again if you'd like or take in a summary of the notes. The other thing I want to highlight is that we want everyone to be using the uh, Q&A, so the question and answer feature in Zoom to be able to uh, ask your questions to our presenters. Um, in this format of a webinar in Zoom, uh, the, the audience yourselves are not able to unmute um, and the chat is disabled as well. So the main way for you to ask any questions is to use the question and answer uh, area. The raise your hand icon also will not uh, allow us to kind of unmute you. Um, before we begin, I also want to let everyone know that the topics that we're discussing uh, today is going to be shared for information purposes. We are not able to uh, share specific medical advice or address particular concerns related to you or your individual scenario. Um, so please uh, try to keep your questions uh, related to more kind of broad or concept areas. Um, and again, you can use the Q&A at any time uh, throughout the webinar, but we will be taking some uh, questions from the audience at the end. Okay, so to get going, I just want us to begin with uh, thanking and introducing you to our two uh, amazing speakers this evening and for giving of their time and sharing their expertise with us. Uh, so first we have Janine and uh, Janine is a physiotherapist uh, with over 15 years of clinical experience and she uses skills in manual therapy as well as vestibular rehabilitation, concussion management, uh, functional movement analysis and, and needling or acupuncture as well to promote recovery in her patients. And so Janine, just want to invite you to say hello. Maybe you can just unmute and say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight or today, wherever you're at. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And a second, uh, but certainly not least here, Craig, uh, we have Craig Weber, who is a physiotherapist as well, um, who is a manual manipulative um, orthopedic therapist. I'm having a hard time speaking this evening, I'm sorry, uh, with additional training in sport and uh, in concussion. And he has a specific interest in spinal neurological and motor vehicle accident injuries as well. And Craig works with athletes of all levels, as well as uh, chronic and more complex patients as well. So again, same thing, Craig, invite you to say hello to our audience today. Hi there, everyone across the country here. It's a real privilege and an honor to be presenting here tonight. And, and uh, on behalf of Life Mark, I certainly would like to thank you for joining us. So thank you. So what we're going to begin with is a series of questions uh, just to kind of make sure that everyone uh, is coming into this conversation at the same level or kind of making sure that we all are level setting. So Janine, um, I want to start off with you and just ask you if you can tell us really high level, what is a concussion? What's the definition and what's it all about? I think one of the important things to realize is the concussion is a complex process of the brain. There are multiple systems that are involved. You have your inner ear involved. We have our vision involved, which can impact our ability to use our eyes back and forth, to focus on a single target. We have our cognitive function involved with a concussion. So, you know, maybe memory issues, difficulties coming up with words. There's an emotional aspect in that system involved that it's very understanding that a concussion is very different than a classic ankle sprain. And it's a very complex manner of the brain that needs a lot of different things looked at. 
That's great. Thank you. And, uh, you know, some of us may have heard some myths uh, around concussion and probably why some of us are here to see if we can get them dispelled. But do you have to have hit your head or lost consciousness uh, to, to have sustained a concussion? Absolutely not. That is one of the things that you constantly hear. There can be different levels of velocity as in how fast the head moves, but you do not need to hit your head or loss of consciousness is not a predictor of a concussion. And one of the other things that's a bit of a myth is everyone's like, oh, I'm going to go for an MRI to determine if I had a concussion. There are no, a good, a clear MRI with nothing on it is exactly what we want to find because those are looking at things more like a brain bleed or those bigger, scarier things. There's no diagnostic image, an X-ray, a CT scan, or an MRI that's gonna be able to say you have a concussion. Great, thank you for just kind of kicking us off with a, a general kind of overview there. So Craig, I'm gonna put it to you. Can you talk to us a little bit about how uh, you might identify a concussion? concussion? So Janine's given us a few kind of starter symptoms maybe there, but what, what would you say is how you identify it? Certainly, so first off, I want you guys to know that concussions can take on many faces. They come in a variety of forms and no two concussions present exactly the same. Which is, uh, which is requiring or requires us as clinicians to, to really develop an individ individualized treatment uh, plan for each patient. In terms of symptoms, I wanna just take a little deeper dive and, and uh, build on what Janine started to, to speak of. So as she said, there are, there are multiple buckets that, that we tend to uh, see affected with, with a concussion. And so in terms of symptoms, symptoms are what we hear from people. And so we've got the cognitive piece. So often what we're hearing from these people is uh, perhaps they, they're having difficulties engaging in dialogue. Maybe they're having difficulties following instructions or comprehending what they're reading. Um, they may have difficulties with focus or, or concentration. And then we move on to the psychological and the emotional support. And that piece is we, we hear these, these people talk about this emotional roller coaster that they're on all the time. And the highs are really high and the lows can be really low. Uh, in addition to that, they, you know, they may feel like they, they come into the office oftentimes and they just break down for no apparent reason. They don't know why they're, they're crying in the office. I don't know why they're crying. It's, you know, it's something that you, you think that it's something you've done, but clearly it isn't. Um, there's a very much a, 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 an emotional piece to this. People often find them to themselves to be very irritable. Their tolerances for people, for their family members are, are, are significantly decreased. And then there's the sleep piece. And oftentimes with concussion, that sleep is dysregulated. Sometimes they sleep too much. Sometimes they're not sleeping enough. We often hear these individuals coming in and saying, I'm absolutely exhausted. And yet I lie down to go to, to bed at night and I'm wired and I can't sleep. There's the neck. Um, and from the neck, there's people report some, uh, some symptoms, including balance, and dizziness, headaches, um, obviously neck pain. And as Janine started to touch on there with the visual component, so our eyes, um, sometimes we may experience uh, double vision, blurred vision, have difficulties tracking objects in space. They are often telling us that they're having difficulties with driving or they're walking through stores and, and shelves and, and shopping carts are coming at them and people are coming at them and they just can't take in all this information. And then there's a the vestibular system, that inner ear piece. This is the dizziness and balance piece of, of that inner ear. And so again, people are describing th those, exact, those exact things, dizziness, balance, maybe their coordination is a little bit off. They just don't feel quite right. And then there's the finally the audit nervous system. And this is kind of a, an overarching piece that kind of oversees the whole, all of these systems to some degree. It has, it can have an effect on our blood pressure. Um, it can create anxiety. It can create uh, to, to sweat rapidly and, and, and vigorously and, and whatnot. So, so we hear a lot of symptoms when we, when we discuss concussions. And so thankfully, um, there's been a tool that that has been uh, has been created, and this tool is for those that are non medically trained. So we've got tools for those that are medically trained, but also for non medically trained individuals to better identify and perform immediate management of concussions. 
And this is called the CRT-6. So as Krista has so graciously uh, provided us with here. And so the CRT-6 is used, it was developed with the athlete in mind, but this can certainly be used in the home, in the workplace, or anywhere else that one may succumb to a concussion. And what that CRT-6 does is, again, it, it helps us to identify as a lay person what, what, someone who may have had a concussion. First off, an ambulance should be called if a red flag is, 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 uh, is occurring. So if you see someone on the sports field, on the ice, on the sidewalk, in your home, who's seizing, who's maybe convulsing, convulsing uh, if they've lost consciousness, if they've seen, they've hit their head and they seem to be confused or um, their, their cognitive state is deteriorating, if they, they, they're vomiting, if they've got a severe or a, a worsening headache, um, perhaps they're, they're combative or agitated, or if they've got a visible deformity to their skull, then we've identified that we should probably take action. Don't take action yourself, but perhaps call an ambulance. If you're in a sporting arena, maybe call for a first aider or a first responder. Um, so some of those symptoms, again, I don't want to go through the symptoms here. We just discussed them, but this, what this tool does is it helps us again as a, as a non-medical person to help us to identify maybe some of those symptoms and some of those signs of a concussion. If Great, can... thanks. Okay, yeah, I'll move you to the next one, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, so finally, the last piece of the CRT-6, in addition to recognizing the signs and the symptoms, is the awareness tool. And so it's a, it's a, a number of very simple, basic questions that we ask these individuals. So again, this was developed for the athlete. They're more concerned about sport, about athletic events here. So what are we, where are we today? What event were, were we doing? Who scored last in the game? So on and so forth. But again, we can modify that to anybody in any, in any, uh, in any environment. You know, what day is it? What, who am I? What's, what's your address? What's your birthday? Those kinds of simple, simple questions that should be almost reflexive and, and just easy to 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 uh to roll off of them so that's the crt6 and it's it's a uh, just a, a great tool to help to help with that identification and and, and help us to take action great thanks Craig, and thanks for sharing a tool that everyone can use and follow up with and again we'll provide a link to that in our follow-up uh, message to you, all of you in about a week as well. And, but you can go Google it as well. Um, so Janine, I'm gonna go back to you. And you know, both of you have talked about kind of all these symptoms that could be happening. Craig's maybe told us how we can, um, you know, what to do right away when we suspect might, someone might have had a concussion. But um, when should someone actually be assessed? Thanks, Krista. So people should look to be assessed right away. I know we often hear, uh, maybe it's not that bad. I'll just wait for a little bit. But the delay of an assessment is one of the greatest predictors for a poor outcome. Every assessment, though, can be different. Like, there's not a standard, you know. Sometimes it's, as we've already talked about, they can be overwhelmed or emotional. Craig mentioned, you know, they can just break down. We modify the assessment to find out where you're at in this current stage. But in this early assessment, we can provide the proper education right off the bat. We can help to avoid some of the fear that can be around of, oh my gosh, what is happening? And I don't know what's going to happen moving forward. And it's the best way that we can promote your recovery by starting you on the right path. Great, thanks. And I know that we've um, heard a myth or, or, or maybe we suspect that it's a myth, but I've heard that people talk about um, having to stay in like a dark room um, until they feel better. Is that something that people should be doing? So this is 100% unequivocally not true, Krista. Um, it's it's kind of an antiquated line of thinking, and and you know some of the some of the people that came before me maybe maybe uh, treated concussions like this, but no, this is absolutely 100% not true. In fact, um, what the the literature is suggesting now is that a brief period of relative rest, and not that's not um, that's not a strict rest. This is a relative rest both physical as well as cognitive should take place or is recommended for up to about 48 hours post-concussion. And beyond that, continuous rest has actually been shown to be a, a detriment to one's recovery. I, 
there, when a concussion takes place, there are chemical and physiological changes that, that take place in the brain, altering the blood flow and, and releasing chemicals in the brain. And these events create what we call an energy crisis. And it's in this state when the brain is healing that we're most vulnerable to sustaining a subsequent or a follow-up concussion when we're in this energy crisis. And so a threshold for activities is, is less and it's decreased at that time. And the brain is requiring additional energy to heal itself. So if you think of, I use this analogy all the time, but if you think of this as being a nerve cell right here, and if you can see my finger. Uh, and so on that nerve cell, that single nerve cell, we've got all of our senses. We've got sight, we've got sound, we've got smell and taste and touch. But in addition to that, we may have balance, we may have a cognitive task. And then again, overarching, we could have someone coming in with all kinds of anxiety, like, like Janine mentioned. So all of these are acting on this, this brain or on this one single nerve cell. Now, if we extrapolate that and think of that nerve cell as being rather than one nerve cell, a collection of nerve cells, like a brain, that brain is trying to heal. That threshold for, the, for what that brain can take has now been diminished. And you start putting all these stimuli, all these triggers onto that brain, and the brain just becomes overwhelmed and can't take it. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens is the most simple of tasks now become very difficult for us. And, and they seem to consume a great deal of that energy that, we, that we're already lacking. And so now a person may feel dizzy, they may have a headache, they may be nauseous, difficulties concentrating, they're walking through a store. I already talked about the shelves coming at them at all different levels, the shopping carts, the people, the noises, the uh, all of this happening in, in, the, in the grocery store, and they can't take it. And so what happens is not only does that, that individual leave that grocery store overwhelmed, they're exhausted, and, and often they become very uh, irritable in the process. And, and then they go, to, they go to lie down, they go to sleep at night, and again, they're absolutely wired. And it's a, it's a real tough situation. Um, and, and if this isn't looked after, if it's not controlled, if it's not, if it's not treated, it's essentially, it's a wash, rinse, and repeat. It's, it just happens day after day after day. And just the other day, really, really interesting, um, I had a lady come in and she says to me, and this explained the energy crisis so well, and she says to me, she says, Craig, I can work 35 hours a week at my desk job. I said, great. And she said, but it takes me 35 hours on the weekend to recover from that 35 hours. I was like, you're clearly in a state of energy crisis. And that's, it just kind of put it all together for me. That's a great way to look at it, that you have to thank your patient there, Craig, for that uh, little thing. And I so asked quickly, her. Did you ask her? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I just want to comment. So um, somebody in the chat has that, you know, wanting to clarify that you are saying that engaging the brain uh, is useful to recovery as long as it's done judiciously and carefully and, you know, in a moderate way. And that disengaging from all activity is not in their best interest. And that is absolutely 100% what you're saying and what the literature is saying uh, for all of us. So thank you uh, to our audience member who summarized that in the chat. We really appreciate your clearly taking it in and understanding it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about these things as we continue on. So Janine, I'm gonna go to you now. Um, so, you know, we talked about what it was, we talked about symptoms. We said, you told us that we should get assessed right away if we suspect or think that we may have had a concussion or someone we know has had a concussion. Craig has said rest only for the first 48 hours or so, but again, it's, you know, not complete rest, um, but that we need to manage that energy crisis. What does early recovery or intervention for a concussion look like? Thank you. Kind of tying right into what Craig was saying on like the sleep and, you know, you're wired, you're exhausted, but then you lie down and go to sleep at night and you're just like, I stare at the ceiling, I toss and turn, and you just kind of keep spinning. We often talk about something called sleep hygiene, and we don't want someone spending the entire day sleeping 12 hours a day and I still feel tired. We want to try and have a organized schedule. We have a regular bedtime and a regular wake up time, and we continue with that pattern. 
there's times in a day where you're going to feel like you really want that nap and you might mess up with that pattern, but you know, you can have relative rest. You can remove yourself from the visual stimulations, listen to some quiet music, or don't go to the grocery store that day, but kind of just put yourself in a quiet environment instead of a loud one. But one of the things is kind of tying into what the person just said in the question and answer, we don't want to avoid everything. So we want to decrease that visual stimulus, which, for example, we spend a lot of times on our cell phones, all ages. Um, a cell phone could be used to make a phone call instead of just texting and going on social media. We can also listen to an audiobook instead of picking up a book and trying to read all these individual words and stressing our head. There are many different ways that we can make these early intervention that you're not just cutting yourself off from everything. We're just modifying it. One of the most important is your sleep. Great. And somebody in the chat actually asked a, a great question related to this is what about the advice about waking someone up like, you know, every two hours within the first day or two days following a concussion? Is that something we should be doing? Absolutely not. That is definitely from like older research and there is just less understood, but now it is more about actually getting quality sleep and rest to help with the recovery. Um, in addition, which I'm gonna pass you off to Craig who talks about the exercise component as well as kind of, we've talked about avoiding some stimulation, but we wanna get you moving. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, so out of the, the, the latest research is really, really focused heavily on exercise or physical activity to, to get us to push through these concussions. And, and I like to think of exercise as being medicine. So the, that, il, that, that research illustrates the, the safety and the benefits of early aerobic exercise, so kind of endurance exercise, and, and even following that initial 48 hours uh, after a concussion. So similar to other, other conditions such as diabetes or the ankle sprain that Janine was talking about, um, diet and exercise both are, are shown to certainly benefit concussion, one's concussion recovery. And not only is the literature showing benefits for the, the you know, those early in the concussion journey, uh, but it's also showing benefit for those that have maybe experienced more of those chronic concussion symptoms. They, maybe they didn't get treated early enough or they weren't assessed early enough. And they've, you know, it's been going on for months now. Again, the, 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 the biggest emphasis in the literature today seems to be get these people moving, get them active, get them physically active and get them exercising. Walking, low impact exercise, um, cycling, if providing they can, you know, they don't have, have issues with their visual system, uh, swimming. So those low impact exercises are great. And the, the, the one caveat is that that we, if you look at the symptom management scale here on the, on the screen, zero being no symptoms, 10 get me to emergency, or as it says here, feels terrible, the worst I've ever felt. As a baseline, your symptoms should be kind of in that zero, maybe up to a two. So as a baseline, you don't want a headache to be too, to be too, uh, to do too much to, to, to manage. You don't want your dizziness. You don't want any of those concussion symptoms we talked about before to be anywhere probably above a two, so mild symptoms. But the, the literature is showing that you're working in a safe zone with exercise, providing you're not moving up more than two points in that scale. So if you're bumping up into that three, four, and you started at a two, you're 100% fine. It's safe and it's actually encouraged. And the other one, the other thing to say about this is that as long as you're providing you're not bumping up more than two points, in addition to that, you don't want to be those, you don't want to have those symptoms linger for uh, excess of an hour. And so again, they, they, they're really, really pushing this, this exercise piece for concussion recovery. Great. Thank you. So great, you know, practical tips, like very, you know, concrete, some boundaries to use. So again, trying to be active, but not overdoing it, but also underdoing it is not the way that we want to go. 
So I'm going to go back to you, uh, Janine, and just wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what would be kind of considered best practice around returning to school if you're a student or you're a child or um, adult child is a student and they are hurt uh, or getting back to work uh, or even just their normal activities around the house. I know we hear talk, lots of people talk about getting back to sport, but can we talk a little bit about what, what those uh, returns to those other activities look like? Absolutely. And as you're probably consistently hearing something, each individual is going to be a different path in all of these different aspects. Um, using school as an example and kind of getting back to learning um, is you have some steps here. There's many modifications that can be taken based on what someone's symptoms are. So we can encourage a student to get back to class, but maybe they're not gonna take notes. They're gonna come to class, they're gonna listen, still be a part of it, but take away some of that stimulation, which requires them to, whether it's type or writing or looking up and down from a screen back up and having to do that, they just go and listen. Maybe when they're starting, you come back at as you see they're returning to part-time school. They may come for their first two classes every morning and then they stop for a week. Then we increase that we find the right small increments to keep challenging the system to return back to where we wanna be. Another school modification could be you're back to class. And again, this is looking more at probably like a high school. You leave the class two minutes early so that you get to your next class before the bell goes, before everybody's in the hallway and the lockers are crashing and people are talking. So you're still there. We're just taking away some of the things that can be overwhelming to your system. And that's where it becomes every person has a different path, but we want to encourage an earlier return to school than a later return to school. We just have to modify that a little bit. In the same example with returning to work, say you work in an office job in a corporate environment, is there a possibility to work from home for a couple of days instead of coming into the office to remove the commute and the noises? Um, is there somewhere where you can work near natural light instead of the fluorescent lights in your office? Um, can we reduce your screen time? You do two hours at a time and then you have a certain break and then you can come back for two hours. Um, and as it matches exactly what Craig was saying in that two out of 10, we don't want to take you from, you know, return to work, return to school is the same thing. You're not going from a two to a nine because then everything's going to crash in your frustration. One of the benefits of returning to normal school activity, you don't want to be isolated. Isolate, especially, you know, we talk about kids, you're taking them away from their team, away from their friends, you're not allowed your phone, you can't text. Like, that adds a whole nother component that makes recovery difficult. We want to get them back with their group. That work stress can be the exact same concept. I'm going to let my team down. I have to go get this done. Okay, I can get this part of it done and still help my team, but we have to modify on this side. So there's many different paths to return to work and return to school, but it's the same thing that we kind of keep saying, we want to start that path early and we just got to make the right modifications to get you going. Great, thank you, Gina. It's a nice high, high level summary and kind of some great practical examples there as well too. Um, so I'm hearing, you know, we talked about early assessment and somebody in the chat actually, you know, said, what about if I had an injury, you know, a uh, couple of months ago, and then I just hit my head again, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, and things seem to have been stirred up, that person should be reassessed again at that time. Would you agree? 100% agree. Something new has happened, right? Yeah. So we want to go, we don't want to make any assumptions. We want to get that re-looked at and see what's going on. Awesome. And it sounds like there's maybe a lot of pieces to this recovery. Um, you know, Craig, can you maybe, like, does it take a long time? Yeah, so the answer to that would be, it depends. It's, it really is difficult to say, Krista. And I think that, you know, Janine highlighted a, a couple of important points there. It's, it's putting those, those tools, those modifications in place. How compliant, though, is a patient with these modifications and with these tools? Um, it's very multifactorial. And in addition to that, what comorbidities do they have? Perhaps they're diabetic. Perhaps they're a migraine sufferer from, you know, prior to the, to the concussion. Maybe, they're, um, maybe they have ADHD or a learning disability or something. And so these all play a role 
in, in determining how long that recovery will, will last. In general, a general rule of thumb is that adolescents typically take a little longer than kind of, you know, early 20s than anyone up to about the age of 64. Um, and that's just, again, what the literature supports. Um, the two primary predictors of good outcomes, again, we've, we've already touched on this. Number one is early access to, to, uh, to an assessment, to a healthcare professional, and ideally that's within seven days. And number two is that when the individual is removed from that activity immediately following a suspected concussion. So for instance, rather than finishing a game or rather than completing a task, that person is sent home, that person is removed from that environment. So those are the two, the two best predictors of, of a positive outcome. So early detection, early management, and early education for the patient are absolutely critical. And in a recent study, um, adolescent athletes with symptoms of a concussion taken out of sport, I believe it was hockey, they immediately, uh, they're taken out of sport immediately, had an average recovery time of 18 days. Those that went in and played just for an extra 15 minutes or a couple of shifts had an average recovery time of 44 days. So 18 days versus 44 days just by not taking that extra shift, by removing themselves from that, that event, that environment, and, and, and uh, it's a significant, significant difference. Uh, the literature suggests in addition, that 90% of individuals should return to learn, or return to school, return to that learning environment by day 10. And a recent Stats Canada report suggested that over half of those experiencing a concussion will have, uh, will have fully resolved within 30 days. And I think that that's probably a little bit long. Anecdotally, I think that, you know, I find, uh, I'm going to say probably 70 to 80% of the people that I see, now keep in mind, these are people that are, that we've, we've identified the concussion, we've started treatment, we've, we've treated them, we've given them the tools. I would say that 70 to 80% of them are probably resolving within two to three weeks. Um, and and the, the news is not all bleak here. The, the good news is that when cared for, when managed properly, that pretty much all concussions will resolve. And even those chronic concussions, those, those guys that are late in the journey again, that haven't been looked after, um, they've got equally a great of chance of, of, of resolution of their symptoms, providing they get assessed, they get treated, and they get educated, and they get those tools in place. Great. Thank you. That's quite optimistic. Then I said those numbers are somewhat reassuring for sure. 70 or 80 percent, two to three weeks or even a month. Um, pretty good outcome. And, and somebody put in the in the Q&A as well. You know, are we going to be talking about, you know, post concussion syndrome or persistent symptoms after a concussion, which is kind of the, the new language around it? Um, so I think, we, you know, we can talk maybe a little bit about that. But Janine, I just want you to see if you can maybe talk to us a little bit about what actual rehabilitation. So you know, those people who maybe have those symptoms lasting, you know, they've had all the right steps in the very beginning that Craig was just telling us about, but their symptoms are still kind of lingering. What does maybe rehab or recovery for them, uh, rehab program look like for them? As I'm pretty sure everyone's tired of hearing us say this, it depends on the individual, um, <laughs> but it really does. And one of the things about, you know, working with concussions is, we already mentioned all the different systems that are involved, which means you should probably have more than one practitioner. There's only, as a physio, there's an aspect of that I can work on. Occupational therapists can assist in another way. A physician assists in another aspect. Psychology is often brought in and the other different aspects of it. So all of those things can play a role. Um, there's a in-depth history that myself I'd want to know about my patient and all of their history all of their symptoms what's happening with them so that's always step one um we can do a, we'll do a big screen you know checking your neurological system making sure different things are working um and then we want to look at the different systems we mentioned our balance and our vestibular system are you having dizziness if that spinning and dizziness is part of it, we want to clear that with some vestibular treatment, which for those of you that have never had it, it's kind of some different movements on a bed, kind of 
checking different rotations to try and clear things to help you feel better. Um, balance different kind of things, you know, starting with just your feet together and can you hold where you're at to dynamic movements, walking around the clinic, tossing things, balance boards, many different aspects. Uh, we've talked about the eyes and Craig mentioned it earlier and can you track different, can you look back and forth? Are you able to kind of focus as something comes forward? All of this stuff can be made into a variety of home exercises that does really require the patient's participation. Not that all recovery from injury, we mentioned the ankle sprain. In general, that's kind of the swelling will go away. You start strengthening, the patient needs to do their exercises. But to cause a change in a lot of our visual systems, the commitment to do the exercises provided is very important in this aspect. Uh, one last thing before it kind of also, which is more stereotypical of the physio side of things, your neck. Your neck plays a huge role in your recovery. And, you know, both Craig and I are kind of manual hands-on therapists, so I can feel like I can speak for both of us. It's an unbelievably important aspect that needs to be treated as well. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, individualized, customized based on what the problems that they're having are is really the key here is what I'm hearing. So I'm going to kind of take a look at some of the questions that we've seen coming in in the Q&A because there's been some um, good ones. And I just want to kind of keep going on the neck uh, issue. Um, and, you know, you guys can decide who wants to take first stab at this one. Um, but somebody asked, like, um, is there a way to tell, you know, maybe if your symptoms are coming from more of like a whiplash or your neck in neck injury versus a concussion? I can jump in there on this one. Um, we definitely have tests that isolate, you know, how your neck is and how you feel if you do certain movements in relation to keeping the neck still and having the head move around. Um, and an experienced therapist that works with this can really use that to be able to narrow down which one may be playing a bigger role. I would never completely treat one without the other. We want to make sure that all of these different components, but we do have assessment skills to try and help maybe, you know, the next seems to be playing a bigger input, but we always want to make sure that you're not just focused on one thing. Craig, you're good. Did you, did you want to add anything in there? No? No, I think that's that's pretty clear. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. There's a couple of questions that have come in around youth and, and uh, you know, also with kind of sport. Um, so I'm wondering maybe Craig, because you're kind of more the, the sport guy, though I'm sure Janine does as well. Um, what about if a child has, you know, a mild concussion? Um, will they still be pulled from play for like a week? Um, and how does that go? Because I've heard people they saying they've heard it kind of takes a week for them to get back or they have to stay out for a week. Yeah, so very good question, whoever brought this up. Um, the, the, the key point there is that this is a mild concussion. The word concussion is being used, right? So they, they've identified, or they've been identified to have a concussion. We're given one brain and we better, we better do well with that brain. Um, if you recall that energy crisis that we spoke of earlier, you know, where the brain is trying to heal, if a person is still experiencing symptoms of a concussion, they're at their most vulnerable at this at this point. And so sometimes what may happen in, 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 in very rare situations, but it, it, it has happened, is what's called a second impact syndrome. And with that second impact syndrome, essentially if one sustains or, or, or um, sustains a second or a third concussion in a very short time before the symptoms are gone from those first concussions, then it can lead to very, very, very serious consequences. Um, and so, again, if this is my son, my daughter, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm keeping them out of out of uh, out of sport, and I'm and I'm listening to what the trainers, what the coaches have to say. Um, so there's there if. Krista, if you can bring up, I don't know if you have access to, there's a return to the sport protocol that we use. And it's a, it's a checklist. Um, it looks somewhat similar to this return to learning, but it's I a six. 
I think I, I think I might have lost it. So if you can maybe just build on this one, maybe that will help them. Okay, so it's a six point checklist. And essentially when we when we when we see a patient, an athlete come in, um, we look at these six different criteria. And so when, when an athlete comes in, we fit them into one of these six categories. The first category is they're seriously concussed. They, they're in that 48 hours of rest period. We're not doing a whole lot other than some, some, uh, some, some rest with them. The second phase of that will take them into, we're gonna start getting them into the activity phase. So we wanna start promoting physical activity, maybe some exercise. And it goes on from there. And so when they come into the clinic, we're gonna put them in according to their symptoms, according to their signs, we're gonna fit them into one of those, those six boxes. Uh, number, four, number five, part of me is they're returning to full practice. They're no longer red shirting. So they're able to take part in contact again, if it's a contact sport. And number six is we're returning them back to sport. Um, so we're gonna fit those, those patients into one of those boxes. And if it's a mild concussion, we're hoping that, you know, she's been pulled after four days or five days. Um, we're hoping that they're probably starting at, at, in the fourth or fifth, the fourth or fifth checkbox right now. What we have to see though, is that when we move them down successively into the next, the next category, they have to be able to uh, show us that they're able to, 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 to manage 24 hours symptom free or with very, very, very mild symptoms before we can move them on to that next stage. So if they're coming in a, a, in the first box, it would take them a full week in order to get them back on the field, back on the ice. They're not generally coming in there. We're typically seeing them kind of at three, four range. They may hang out there in one of those boxes for, for a couple of weeks. They may be able to plow through a little bit quicker. So that's kind of how, how I would look at that. Great, thank you. I'm sorry for not having that ready for you. I right. planned to have it because um, like, we expected that that might kind of come up. Um, there's a couple of questions um, also in the chat about diagnostic imaging. So I'm going to go back to you, Janine, because I think you were the one that kind of took us through a little bit of this last uh, last time. So people are throwing out various different types of diagnostics that um, you know would this help? Would this show you know? With an MRI, with a CT scan, with an fMRI to show me um, they heard about a certain protein in the blood um, that you know might be a, a signal. So can you maybe just uh, talk a little bit about you know what the evidence says about diagnosis uh, with various different testing procedures? Yes, um, there's tons of different research which hopefully eventually they do find something that might help, but. We're looking at a lot of the different diagnoses looking a little bit more centrally, which is how the exact brain structure is. So the MRI, the CT scan, those things are specifically bruise in the brain, damaged vessels, all of those things we don't want. Um, but the peripheral side, so the kind of as we talked about the other systems, at this point, there's no definitive diagnostic imaging test of a concussion that can say this specific blood test will say that you have a concussion, right? The post-concussion syndrome is a lot of these different tools and um, surveys, questionnaires, symptom management that lead to these all seem like post-concussion symptoms, but that specific diagnostic imaging, which I think is a big frustration to a lot of people because they want to have that, this test showed that I'm not making this up. Um, but you're not making this up. We just don't have a piece of paper to be able to show that this test does it. Craig, I'm not sure if there's any other diagnostics that you've read on something, but that's sort of where I've last seen it. Yeah, that's pretty similar to what I, what I read. Um, I know that in that same vein, I think that it's important to recognize that Research in this field is ever evolving and it really has taken off significantly in the last 10 to 12 years. Um, there's been far more research done in the last five years probably than there was in, in all the years combined prior to that. And so we may find that, you know, maybe biomarkers or, or maybe they'll be able to tell by, by with blood tests or some kind of some form of imaging in time that we may see the, the ability to make that diagnosis. But, at this time, this is not there, so. 
like mm-hmm. Janine said, if if your if your MRI comes back clean, that's a win. It doesn't mean that we've ruled out a concussion, but it certainly means that we've ruled out something far more sinister, like a like a brain bleed or something of that nature. So, so consider yourself lucky. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of other kind of themes coming up, and so we'll take a couple more here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, the next one is uh, I'm going to kind of merge together a couple. Um, someone's asking about uh, baseline testing, and that you know their child's team is talking about baseline testing before the start of the season, uh, and so they're wondering is this really needed? And then kind of related in the Q and I'm also seeing is impact the impact test a good test? for concussion. So maybe uh, maybe Craig, you can uh, lead us off on that one and tackle the two concepts maybe together. Yeah, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with the impact test, it's it's a, a what we call a neurocognitive test. And it's the, the, the gold standard for neurocognitive testing, basically meaning um, testing the brain uh, in terms of, it looks at a variety of things, but uh, from a cognitive or a, a, a learning standpoint, I guess. And so is it a good test? 100%. It is the gold standard as far as I know, and I use it very frequently. Is it the only test? And is it going to help us to determine if there's been a concussion that's taken place? No, it won't. Um, it's in an isolation. It's not, it's not, uh, the utility isn't great. But I think if we use it as one of the tools in, in the toolbox that Janine had mentioned in our assessment, I think it's a fantastic test. That's really the the piece that I use to measure that particular piece of of an individual. But there are so many other tests, again, that Janine had mentioned and and many others that she didn't even mention that that we that we use in uh, on a daily basis when we're looking at these assessments, when we're looking at these concussions. Um, The first question was, sorry, what was it again? Well, baseline testing. Baseline testing. Yeah. So baseline testing. So again, we do a ton of baseline testing. Um, we, we test baseline test again, we're looking at uh, the athletic populations here, but it's, you know, it's sporting teams. Sometimes parents want their children to come in and get tested, uh, independently of the team. Um, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefit to this, this testing. Um, for one thing, what it does is it allows us to see that individual when they're not, when they're not concussed, when they're at their, their best, if you will. Um, it allows us also to identify any nuances, any anomalies that may, may, be, uh, may be apparent with this person. For instance, Janine mentioned the tracking with, with the eyes. Maybe, maybe this individual has a lazy eye. Maybe they've got a, a learning disability again. Maybe there's something that, that we, wouldn't, we, we, may, we may pick up when we're testing post-concussion that if we didn't know that that existed pre-concussion, then it would throw us off and we would think that perhaps problem there's a there's a larger problem going on than what we what we initially thought. So it really just allows us to kind of tease out those those nuances and, and, and have a better understanding as to who it is that we're working with post concussion. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, one or two more. So the next one, and again, I'm seeing it in a couple places here as well. And I think both of you, uh, Craig and, and Janine, have mentioned about you know the stressors that kind of go along um, with having had a concussion. And so some of the questions are, you know, is PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder or things like that is that something that is common related to uh, concussion and you know how might someone overcome some issues related to that um as i feel like we've mentioned a few times there's many different emotional um it's hard processing um and one of the most important parts about this part of the rehab is having a team you need to be working with the people who that is what they specialize in from psychologists, occupational therapists. Um, as speaking as a physiotherapist, that's when, you know, being part of a larger organization like we are in this group, we have that referral path. And we need linking people with the right practitioner that can address those specific needs on their recovery process is the first thing that I look for to help with. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Um, I think I, 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 you guys don't know that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to rapid fire at you. There are a number of symptoms that people have listed in the Q and A here, saying, you know, does this might this be related to concussion? Might this be common with concussion? So I'm just going to shout them out, and you can say yes, maybe no, and we'll just kind of go through it. Depends. Uh, hmm. Depends. It depends. <laughs> no, that's the physio answer. We're not going to use that one. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do. Uh, okay, here, hold on. Um. Uh, vertigo. Yes. Uh, Janine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, BPPV specifically. Yes. B BPPV. Could yeah. Be. Yeah. So BPPV, for those that don't know, is a vestibular um, issue where there's crystals in the inner ear that get out of where they belong into not where they belong and certainly can um, occur related to that. Um, One of the things with uh, like BPPV is a very specific part of vestibular. And as a treating therapist, that can often, not always, be cleared quite quickly and can help kind of, whew, that part of it's gone. Now we can move on. Great. Amazing. And somebody actually said that they saw one of our vestibular therapists. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, temperature regulation of your body, Craig. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. That's yeah. your own uh, nervous system. That's right. Uh, memory issues, and specifically, Janine, the question is, does physio treatment help with memory issues? So maybe just looping back to your uh, network of, of uh, clinicians that you've got there. Absolutely, and memory is a tough one, and that we're, like we have said, linking back. There's a lot of time, too, we've talked about so many different processes, so many different symptoms and systems and all this stuff. It gets overwhelming. Um, sometimes when you clear a couple things, like, you know, your vision starts to feel better. Uh, your balance is kind of feeling better. Your neck is feeling better. Other things can just clear. That doesn't even doesn't feel like it should connect. But sometimes it can happen. But if the memory is not coming back, again, yes, you've got to work with your team. Occupational therapist can come up with great things to help promote the memory. When that okay. anxiety starts to lift, yep. off that two, memory will fall. Two last ones. Uh, Craig, uh, ticks like neurological ticks. Mm, maybe <laughs> I haven't. I can honestly say I haven't really seen it. Okay, uh, Janine, last one. Asthma. I haven't seen that linked as a like this causes this causation effect. Um, so we're not allowed to say it depends, but I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for entertaining me. Uh, so I just saw a bunch of different things in there that people were wondering about. So I thought that'd be a great way to do it. All right. So we're just going to wrap up because we're getting close to an hour. I again want to thank both you, uh, Craig and Janine, for joining us and for answering our questions and trying to guide us through uh, understanding in this very complex and ever evolving area. Um, of injury. Uh, up on your screen uh, to our attendees, uh, we have a variety of different ways that you can connect with LifeMark or to find a clinician for you. Uh, I see a number of people in the Q&A who are asking about, um, you know, do you know a sleep specialist in Alberta? Um, you know, please contact somebody at LifeMark, at LifeMark, call the clinic closest to you and ask that question. The teams will know uh, in your region uh, where you can help. Um, if you're not sure if your symptoms could potentially be related to concussion or that some sort of rehabilitation could help, we definitely encourage you to, to contact us, go in for an assessment if, you, uh, if you're able in your local community. We have clinics across the country and even so also offer virtual care. So again, if you are not in the community that we are, we may be able to uh, do that as well. So you can contact us in a number of ways on your screen, follow us on all the social channels so you can join us for fun things like this. Um, and again, thank you, uh, Craig and Janine, and to Andrea in the background for helping to answer all those questions that were coming in. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Thank you so much. Keep an eye on your inbox in about a week or so for a summary of today's session and the recording. And we'll also be sending you a feedback survey tomorrow to tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, and what you might like to see more of uh, in future sessions. So again, thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a great evening and a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.